the other school is saying that you know there's a there's somebody behind the curtain drive you know deciding what the body and mind is going to do there's some separate master or driver of the body and mind in charge of it telling it what to do right and then uh, you know this one is that my life is made up of all the moments of of uh, all the moments of my life that are real this life is made up of all the moments in my life which are real from their own self so true okay. the last two are what beliefs held back to the school I mean, you know, is 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 this the sum of its parts? Right? Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this all is. I mean, is the top and the bottom, and the inside and the outside, and the clay and the paint and the rest? Are all these parts together? We should see them. Yeah, so Majemika would say, no, they're not a lid until you overlay lid. Yeah. Right? Until you overlay the identity lid, it's not a lid. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, it's always the same trap. I mean, when you point to the object and say, you know, is this the sum of its parts? <coughs> implicit in that question, but unstated, is, is this the sum of its physical parts and no more? When, in, in fact, an object like that is constructed it's a constructive thing. Yeah. And that's, it was done, it was came to being with intentionality. Yeah. It foresaw a use. Right. It foresaw a user right. partaking of the use. But all of that is, is not gross material. All of that is information. Right. Yeah. It's data. Mm -hmm. So if you recast the question and said, is that lid the sum of its physical parts plus all of the information that went in, into its devising and then all of the information that arose unintentionally its creation, okay, then you can answer that question, yes. If you don't put... That the, was heresy in case <laughs> it's, if, if, you, if you don't put the concept lid on it, none of that matters. It's not a lid. Isn't the concept lid made of parts that you put together? Um, somebody who has a language can use a lid for its intended purpose. But would it be a lid for them? It would function as a lid, therefore it's a lid. Well, I disagree. Well, if they use it for the same purpose <laughs> as a labeler of use it, then... Okay. What's the, what, what meaningful difference is there between the labeler and the non-labeler? It's very important. It's a very important point. It's a very important distinction. If you don't call this as a, a lid, then how does it exist and what does it exist in? Coco, the gorilla, yeah. has a kitten and a cat. Yeah. I don't think it calls the kitten a kitten. Yeah. But it holds it and pets it. They plainly relate in the same way. Exactly. And we can assume, as we know the people, that Coco doesn't say to itself, um, discursively and so hopefully kitten. Exactly. But it's a kitten. But no, 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 no. That's no, no. What is <laughs> <laughs> What is Coco's reality? What is Coco's Coco's reality is it has a pet kitten. But that's from your side. That's your imposition. You don't know what Coco's putting on the kitten. You don't know what Coco's doing. Well, if you can observe the labeler, then I can observe Coco. I didn't follow that. Well, you, you, you make the imputation concerning the, the labeling as though you were invested in the reality of the one doing the labeling. No. So why can't I say the one? No. I understand what Coco is doing. No, it's a very important point. The perceiver, Coco, is putting something on that furry thing that she's petting. We don't know what she's putting on there. You know, whatever, whatever mental trip Coco is, whatever label Coco is giving that furry thing that she's petting is Coco's reality. But that's just the Isn't point. that reality still the sum of the parts that Coco but what is the experience of it? What is the identity? But that's just what is the, the nature of it? Coco has the Coco. You see? That's the essence of the point. That's just that's the that's the debate. Does Coco have the experience of having a pet without the presumed ability to label it as a pet? So I will argue that plainly, if you if empirical yeah. observation means anything at all, yeah. okay, then we can say Coco is having the experience of being a pet owner, a pet haver yeah. without the well, I, I won't. I won't split hairs on it because I would say something a little slightly different. I would say that Coco is having an experience, which appears to us as having a pet. But we don't know how it appears to Coco because we can't be in Coco's mind. And that's, Coco's that's, mind. that's 
it's more solipsism. I don't know what the labeler is really doing when it picks up from in and puts it on the teacup. I'm only imagining that. Yeah. But isn't that the, the nut of it? Isn't the nut of it simply that each individual perceptual event is reality for that being, and that's what matters. And so the perceptual reality of Coco versus the perceptual reality of Bruce are unique to those beings, and are different. I don't see how that proves the teaching. Well, that's the heart of the teaching. The heart of the teaching is, is that your <clears throat> perception of the event is unique to you and your mind. And Coco's perception of the event is unique to her and her mind. But then we all have our own individual vocabulary of labels instead of having shared vocabulary. Mm -hmm. We do. Well, we do. That's it. I mean, there are you know, culturally and linguistically shared labels, and there are culturally and linguistically, linguistically not shared labels. So then if I can relate to his label, mm -hmm. then why can't I? Well, he can say, this is how I think of a lid, and this is what a lid does to me, and, you know, for me, and Coco can't do that. Can't co Coco gestures, Coco has behaviors, they're not verbal, but actually they are verbal. She can croon, yeah. and um, make soothing noises to the cat. Mm -hmm. So, okay. there's no... Yeah, go ahead. I feel like we're, the, 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 conven the idea that came up the, like last night was in class, of bringing up a conventional reality that we're all sharing, is it... I can't, I can't buy that, that it's conventional reality. I feel like it's almost in, in layers. Maybe we're understanding things archetypically, even when we communicate and you say, what, like, what, what phrase am I using? Or how am I <clears throat> petting the cat? You know what I mean? But you can't actually understand it fully like I am. I'm even verbally communicating petting a cat, which internally is a whole, it, you know, the experience is way deep. I want the sensation is to touch the furry fur and the cuteness in its eyes. You can't understand all of that, but you can understand the archetypical concepts. And that's how we're actually communicating is with these archetypes, right? So a petting a cat or a pet, even when you're said it's Coco's pet, it's loaded, you know? So I think actually that's part of what we're getting at is a conventional reality. There isn't one conventional reality, but maybe there's, we're connected. It's, it's on these deeper levels. That's why things like heart and emotion, you know, connections are also this other way of communicating with one another. And the archetypical language is, you know, really critical. And that's what we're actually listening to and talking about when we're communicating more. The, the, fuzzy, the fuzzy moving thing is not emanating catness, you know? There's a fuzzy living thing there in Coco's hands and Coco's experiencing it through her senses and her mind. You are too, to the present, right? Um, but the catness is not being exuded from the fuzzy thing, you know? Coco's mind is functioning in a certain way and is having a certain experience, right? I mean, you can think of it like, and it, one way to say it is, is it's forced upon Coco, it's a she, right? But it's forced upon her by her crumb, right? I, I like to think of it as um, her mind has certain electrical Our minds have certain electrical, energetic impulses and function in a different way. Right? So minds which are functioning differently are perceiving differently. Right? Senses which take in data differently are perceiving differently. I mean, just in an ordinary physiological sense, you know. Um, and you have the issue of I don't know, you know, dogs only see can't see color. I don't know what gorillas see. You know, I don't know if they see color or not. They see opinion. <laughs> but, you know, what made my mind have certain energetic, uh, a certain energetic configuration? You know, what made my mind, my mind's circuitry or electrical activity or impulsive activity function in a particular way at any given instant, at any given moment, right? As opposed to Coco's circuitry and electrical impulses functioning in a certain in that way at a given moment. To me, that's the ripening of karma. Okay? You know, so the ripening of Coco's karma is the activity of her mind at that moment in time, all the electrical and energetic and subtle impulses and processing that's going on, just as yours is. And so to say that hers and yours are the same, to me, it doesn't make any sense. You know? I mean, you could say that in the ballpark or there's some similarities. In the no, I, I didn't mean that we have a telepathic advantage. Of 
or uh, an equivalence. But your perception of the of the lid of the teacup is not exactly the same as mine. There are some people who are phobic about teacups. Yeah. And the people love teacups. <laughs> uh, and it's the same it's the same teacup. But yeah. you know, the, the response is cognitive. I think the point is we would have enough of a commonality uh, experiential uh, commonality to, to, so that I wouldn't say it was a key So uh, that's all I'm saying about Foucault, right. is that she can relate to a, an, an object similarly enough right. so that you know, without, yeah. without the specific label, she seems to be able to relate to it as though she was party to the uh, mm -hmm. process. And so it seems what Foucault really thinks, I don't know. Yeah, but you're, if I understand, you're saying she's in the ballpark. Basically. Until she can post it to Instagram, right. never <laughs> really going to understand. <laughs> I mean, why are we talking about all these things, right? Why does it matter that um, you know, the moving fuzzy thing is, is a pet for Coco and, or, or who knows what for Coco, you know, a cat for Bruce, or um, that one mind perceives something one way and another mind perceives something another way. I mean, you know, the fact that the identity doesn't come from this, I mean, the fact that the identity comes from me means that this could be anything for me, right? This could be experience as literally anything for me because it's a function of my senses and my mind. And if I could configure my mind and my senses to perceive this as blissful, it would be that for me. Right? So how do I do that? How do I get my senses to function? How do I get my mind to function? How do I get all of those electrical, subtle, energetic impulses to fire and go off in a way where I'm getting like tingles up my spine all day long. I mean, everything's giving me like this massive bliss rush. Right? Like, how do I do that? How do I experience the yeah. world and everyone in it in all of reality? That's that way? the function of karma, right? It's the cause event. The cause event is you are now forced to pick up this tea thinking that it's hot black tea and to make your throat feel better. And you take a drink and it's yesterday's cold coffee. Thing. And then the next day, you pick up the same mug, thinking it's going to be hot black tea, and it is hot black tea, and it does make your throat feel better. And it's simply past actions that have created that. So it's the same perceptual event. You're picking up your hot tea. One day it's your wife's cold coffee from the day before, and the next day it's the actual tea that you made that morning. Yeah. So that's the point. The point is, is that we can do that. Is we can. We can adjust our reality, you know? We can affect our reality, and we can affect everything in our reality. The way you do it is by collecting the right karma. So to have a reality where everything is giving me massive bliss all the time, I have to collect very powerful virtue. I have to collect some extremely powerful virtue, right? Extremely massive goodness to be able to have the result of experiencing everything as ultimate Highest, highest positive ripening all the time, right? So, I mean, not only that, I'd like to change the perception of my suffering. I'd like to change the perception of my death and, you know, transform it into something else, right? In this life before I die. And that's the idea of the Caesar teachings and the Tantric teachings, is just to learn to collect karmas which are powerful enough that they can ripen in this lifetime to transform the nature of our Perceptions before we die, and so um, on that note, you may Kenzo Rinpoche is giving the tantric teachings and initiation. I think soon, right? Oh, it's in uh, oh, soon. Oh, not soon. In June. Summer. June. So you know, if you if you are interested in, in uh, secret teachings, or uh, you know, I'd encourage you to, to check it out and look into it, and investigate further because it's an opportunity to take the things which we've learned here further. You know, we've gone through 12 sutra courses which have given a very solid, profound foundation uh, in Buddhism. And if you've been through the 12 courses, then you have a very good basis to, to progress on to the, to the higher teachings where you can then basically take what we've learned and apply it in a, in a more powerful way. And the higher teachings are essentially the 
powerful application of the sutra teachings. So you have to learn the sutra teachings, you have to learn them, then you uh, engage in practice to apply them in a much more concerted and, and probably uh, powerful way. So, so if you've done the sutra and you like the sutra, then I would encourage you to continue on. If you haven't done the sutra, I would not encourage you to continue on. <laughs> so there's that. Um, okay, so, you know, and that's, you know, death is nothing more than a perception, right? It's just a sum, it's just milliseconds of perception of the body shutting down, and it's not self-existent. You know, we have this perception, we can have the perception of, of ourselves not breathing, not moving, and we can also not have that perception, and that's the idea of, of engaging in a powerful collection of virtue, so that those right things don't occur, and those perceptions don't occur, uh, because, you know, it's a projection of my own mind, right? <coughs> I mean, death is nothing more than a projection of our own mind, just like life is 